Great, thank you. All right. Delighted to be part of this uh, class, and I'm going to be talking about an illness called myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome. We'll be talking about myth versus reality during this presentation. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself, since this is an advanced community psychology class at DePaul University. And I thought you'd like to maybe know a little bit about my training, where I came from. Um, now, Wundt was actually the founder of psychology. And it turns out that I studied with a person named David Kretsch when I was an undergraduate at Brandeis. And I remember he was a guest, um, he was doing a sabbatical at Brandeis when I was there. Um, he was from the California school system. And he was a social psychologist, um, and he had actually studied with some people who had been connected with the founder of psychology. So, um, and I remember in his class, he kind of said that after um, he gave his first lecture, he went around the class and shook all of our hands, and he said, I'm passing on the mantle from the founder of psychology to you. So it was kind of interesting. So again, just kind of getting an idea that psychology really isn't that old in terms of uh, lineage. But when I was at uh, Brandeis as well as University of Rochester as a graduate student, um, I had a chance to actually meet B.F. Skinner, um, one of the founders of behavioral psychology. Um, and I studied with one of his associates named um, Holland, and I took a class with him as an undergraduate. And as a graduate student, I worked with a person named Stanley Sapone. And actually, I worked in a behavioral laboratory where we worked with non-speaking children. Um, and we tried to get them to um, develop skills. And he was actually a very radical behaviorist, and even more so than a B.F. Skinner. So if you ever said anything that involved any emotions or anything that wasn't descriptive behavior, he would have like a temper tantrum. So uh, he was very, very strict. Um, but I also had some, had, um, some work with a guy named Brendan Marr, um, who was my advisor at Brandeis. And he wrote the first abnormal psych class based on uh, more behavioral principles. Um, and Edmund Jacobson, the person who invented progressive relaxation, um, I actually I invited here to give a colloquium at DePaul when he was in his 90s. Um, so I had a chance to meet him before he died. And Wolpe and Franks I also had chances to meet at different times. Um, so all of these people had some effect on my interest in more behavioral approaches to psychology. Um, but also um, I was very interested in humanistic psychology, and I went to Brandeis University um, in 1968 um, to actually study with Abraham Maslow, who was one of the founders of the humanistic psychology movement. Um, I only had a chance to meet him a couple times because he left Brandeis and ended up going to California. Um, but I did take a class with Maury Schwartz, who wrote Two States with Maury. Um, and um, one of Carl Rogers' students, Chris Dowell, I actually worked with as an undergraduate. Um, and Fritz Perls, I also had a chance to meet and went to one of his workshops um, before he died. Mm. So these were all humanistic influences that have actually today gone into what's called positive psychology. Uh, but this is again, just as behaviorism is a very strong strand within psychology, humanistic psychology is another very strong strand. Uh, because I was going to graduate school in the uh, early 1970s, um, psychology was still dominant at that time by more of a psychoanalytic model. So I had, as an undergraduate, I actually uh, had a chance to meet one of Sigmund Freud's patients who was still in a psychiatric hospital um, and still very psychotic. Uh, when I was in graduate school, my advisors um, some of them felt that I was kind of too behavioral, so they asked me to do an internship um, with a guy named um, Howard Friedman. And Fra Howard Friedman had studied with Deutsch and Murphy, who again was directly connected with Sigmund Freud. So I'm a couple generations away from Freud, and I learned how to do actually classic psychoanalytic therapy with um, VA patients. Uh, but I also had to train with some people who were Neo-Freudians, including Rita Underwood, at Strong Memorial Hospital, who used the H.S. Sullivan or Neo Freudian perspective. These are different ways of using psychoanalysis, of going back to the family, going back to other dynamics that might be affecting people's functioning. 
But most importantly um, is community psychology, where as a first year graduate student in 1971, I had a chance to meet Emery Cowan, and he became my advisor. And what Emery said to me very early on was that there's never going to be enough psychologists to meet all the demand for services and the needs for services. So he said we need to be thinking about creative new ways of extending services through training paraprofessionals, through consultation, through working with neighborhood support groups, um, and also focusing on prevention rather than just after the fact treatment. So that was a very appealing notion for me. And he also said that paraprofessionals might be just about as effective as professionals. And as a first year graduate student, that's something that was a little bit threatening to think that here I was going to grad school for four years, and I might not be more effective than someone who didn't have any of this training. And that's in part because I think sometimes paraprofessionals bring with them a lot of passion and enthusiasm for what they're doing. Um, and sometimes professionals might lose a little bit of that over time. But certainly, we as psychologists, can work with paraprofessionals to extend the reach of services. Um, I also had a chance when I came to DePaul to work with Ed Zolik. I don't know if you know it, but Ed Zolik was the chairman of the psych department. Um, and he founded the doctoral program in the mid-1960s. So DePaul was one of the first clinical community programs in the country. And Ed Zolik was one of the first clinical community psychologists um, actually doing work from the 1960s on. Um, he retired around 1989 um, and actually ended up uh, passing away this last year. Uh, but again, um, very important people in the field of community science. And Jim Kelly was at the University of Illinois Chicago, and also I had a chance to work with him um, and get a lot of influence from his ecological perspective. So all these different people had an effect on me, but I'm just sort of saying that these are the types of influences from the humanistic interest to behaviorals, procedures, to more psychoanalytic training to understand those methods, and ultimately community psych, which is really trying to understand how people interact with their environments and the importance of context, which is what you're probably learning in the classrooms that you're having your community concentration in. So when I came to the DePaul University with my PhD, um, in 1980, I was one of the people that helped founded the Human Services Concentration. So that was an applied program for undergraduates, and I used to teach in that for many years. Um, so that was one way of giving students a chance to get some clinical experience in their senior year so that they could then be a little bit more competitive um, when they went to grad school or in the job market. And then in 2007, with Ola and others at the Paul, I helped get the community concentration going. So this concentration is another thing. So, and again, as a clinical community psychologist, I was able to help initiate these types of programs at DePaul to actually provide some training. And also in 2000, um, I was one of the people with Joe Ferrari to help develop a PhD program in community psychology. Um, so, I have interests in both clinical psychology as well as community psychology. And these are some of the strands that have influenced me in the work that I've done over the last number of years. And, um, and since I came here in 1975, this is actually my 40th year at the Paul University. So again, it suggests that you can really be committed to a setting for a long period of time, and that gives you a chance to understand how you can actually make changes in those settings to help others. So working with ME and CFS, ME stands myalgic encephalitis, CFS for chronic fatigue syndrome. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Patients with ME and CFS are more functionally impaired than people with type 2 diabetes, congestive heart failure, multiple sclerosis, and end-stage renal disease. But there's a lot of stigma on these patients, even though they have these types of impairments. 95% of individuals seeking medical treatment for these illnesses report feelings of estrangement and 85% of clinicians view these types of illness, ME and CFS, as wholly or partially psychiatric disorders in a recent study published in 2011. So hundreds of thousands of patients cannot find a knowledgeable or sympathetic physician to take care of them. 
And that's the situation we're still faced with today. I think part of this is due to some of the myths of this illness. And what I'd like to show is how myself as a clinical community psychologist can try to do some work with these myths. And I want to emphasize it takes time to work on these things. Sometimes a commitment of five, even ten years or longer to make a difference if you want to work on a particular area. So let's first talk about the first myth. Is it a rare disorder? Um, it's only rare if you think about flawed ways of collecting prevalence data. So in the 1990s, um, early 1990s, um, the, the Centers for Disease Control did a prevalence study. Um, and in their prevalence study, they went to physicians who made referrals in four different cities. And the physicians made referrals, and then they worked up those referrals to see how many people might have this illness. That CDC study was very influential, and it only found about two to seven cases per 100,000, meaning that there might have been probably maybe 20,000 people with this illness in the whole country, meaning it's like a rare disorder, according to their prevalence estimates. They also found that most people with this illness were white middle-class women, and that's how the yuppie flu name came. So people often thought of this illness as the yuppie flu illness. Well, our group in Chicago um, thought that there was some problems with that particular research. Um, if physicians are the people who are making the referrals, physicians might not actually think that people have this illness, and physicians might not sort of recruit them into the study, um, and some people might not have physicians. So if you take those two biases, it's not a great way to come up with prevalence numbers by having physicians as the middle people to make your referrals. So you really want to go directly to the people themselves. Um, and that's what we did. We spent, if you can believe it, several years trying to get this grant funded, and then another number of years basically collecting the data, and several other years trying to get it published. Um, and ultimately disseminated. So this whole effort took almost 10 years of work to try to work on just this issue of trying to find out what the prevalence numbers are. And what we wanted to do is rather than having physicians to basically tell us whether we should work those patients up, we wanted to go to a community sample. And this is what's called epidemiology, where you're basically trying to get a large community sample, call people randomly, and then work up those who have some of the symptoms and work them up both medically and psychiatrically. Um, and that's what we did. Um, we worked on this project for a number of years. I might mention, though, that this was not an easy project to get funded. And when we initially brought our proposal to the federal government, the federal government kind of said, well, gee, if this is such a rare disorder, you don't really need to do it because if you for example, trying to get 28,000 people randomly, you probably won't find anybody with the illness. So we had to do some pilot work initially to try to convince them that we had some rationale for doing the study. And even when we got the pilot work, which we got some of the national self-help organization to help provide some of that funding so that we could collect on a small sample, they still weren't interested when we showed that we thought the estimates were higher. So again, it's a process of constantly going back and forth with federal officials, sending proposals in, and just not giving up. And that's the key piece that I just keep emphasizing. Doing this type of advocacy research often takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of passion, where you basically keep working at something, and you don't give up when basically obstacles occur, because these obstacles constantly occur in whichever area you might be kind of doing work in. Well, our findings were of the people that we diagnosed after doing this community-based study was that 90% had never been diagnosed prior to our study as having this illness called CFS or ME. And the prior estimates had suggested there might be 20,000 people with this illness, and our estimates suggested it might be up to a million people with this illness. So again, it wasn't a rare disorder. So doing this basic research actually was able to change some of the myths about whether this illness was actually rare or more common. In addition, we found that actually people who were Latinos or people who were African American actually had rates that were higher 
than whites Caucasians. So again, that suggested that this yuppie flu disease probably was not the case. This is just a chart of showing how rates of CFS per 100,000, and as you can see, this rates for Latinos is almost, it's actually twice as high as the rate for whites. And one of the reasons we were able to find all these Latinos in our study was that we were able to actually have people who are Spanish speaking make some of those phone calls. And we also were able to, in a sense, if someone we identified in the community as possibly having this illness, we provided transportation to a medical center too. So and again, you have to sometimes provide the supports to basically be able to get those folks who might be highest risk into your studies. But if you provide those resources, you have a better chance of reaching those individuals. In terms of CFS prevalence to other disorders, as you can see, with women with CFS, the rates are actually higher than women with HIV, women with lung cancer, women with breast cancer. So this 522 per 100,000 suggests that with women with CFS, these rates are higher than very, very other common disorders that get a lot of public attention. So that suggests that this is an illness that needs to be taken seriously. And that's what epidemiology does. Community-based, good, accurate epidemiology provides estimates that could then be used by public policy people to make a difference. And this particular research ultimately got written up. Um, this is a New York Times article. And in Chicago, the Chicago Defender also had this article indicating African Americans suffer from CFS at higher rates, commonly overlooked than in whites. So again, when you do research, the media can basically acknowledge it, and then that media has influences on the legislatures and people who have some opinions that have resources that can be given to different federal agencies. So the first myth was that it was a rare disorder, and we used basic research that was community-based to basically shatter that myth. And I might add that I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm a clinical community psychologist, but because I have that community framework, I was able to bring people together, including Judy Richmond at the University of Illinois at Chicago, who is an epidemiologist, as well as survey researchers, as well as statisticians, as well as physicians. So we have the ability to bring a team together to basically study these questions as opposed to, for example, just trying to do it all ourselves. And I think that's one of the things that you kind of hear again and again in this community psychology class, is that the more we partner with other people, we don't have to be experts in everything, but what we can do is partner with others to basically make a difference. And that's what that was in terms of trying to shatter a myth. So if you really want to think about second order change, you really want to sort of make a difference, that difference can be occur by doing basic research and partnering with others to try to shatter myths. This is one way of thinking about second order change. But another myth about this illness is the case definition. The case definition is inaccurate. So we're going to kind of take another myth and sort of examine it and see what might have been wrong with that in terms of the stigma that ultimately attributes to the patients because of a possible problem with the case definition. <coughs> So, case definition is like a house of cards. That foundation at the bottom has to be firm. If that foundation is not firm, then all the layers that go on top of it might be a little bit shaky. So, case definition has to be able to say a person has something and other people don't have it. But if that decision is fuzzy and you don't make a good distinction, then ultimately it makes for problems with trying to define, for example, biological markers or other characteristics of the illness. You might be describing other people who aren't specific to that illness. So that's why it's so critical to have a good case definition for any illness or social condition that you might have an interest in. Now the problem in this area was that there was a non-empirical case definition that started up in 1988, changed in 1994, and today there's actually another case definition that's being talked about as well. Let's look at the most 
widely used case definition in the chronic fatigue syndrome area, and that's called the Fukuda criteria. <coughs> and let's just go through what this case definition says. It says patients are required to experience chronic fatigue of a newer definite onset for six or more months. That's not substantially alleviated by rest, not the result of ongoing exertion, and produces significant reductions in occupational, social, or personal activities. And these criteria require the concurrent occurrence of at least four out of the following eight symptoms. Now, these eight symptoms are very important because you have to have four of them. The ones in the white are generally thought of as not as prevalent as the one in the red. The ones in the red are unrefreshing sleep, post-exertional malaise lasting more than 24 hours, and persistent or recurring impairment in short-term memory or concentration. These things occur in people who have this illness called ME and CFS. However, these other symptoms of sore throats, of tenders, lymph nodes, muscle pain, multiple joint pain without joint swelling or redness, headaches of a new type, pattern, or severity. These are very common symptoms. Many people have them. The problem is that a patient might not have these three core cardinal symptoms, might have four of these other symptoms, and then get counted as a case. So just think about it. If, if an illness or disease has something that you need to have, but it's not critical for counting them as a case, think about what that does to your research. And that's what all the research has been based on in this area. A case definition that didn't require specific symptoms. So, it's possible that a misdiagnosis can occur. For example, a person with major depressive disorder could be diagnosed with ME or CFS. Depression, major depressive disorders, usually involve chronic fatigue, number of months of fatigue, plus four minor symptoms. For example, these symptoms are very common in depression. Unrefreshing sleep, joint pain, muscle pain, impairment in concentration. So if a person with major depressive disorder had these symptoms and got counted as a case of ME or CFS, that could be a problem, okay? because they really have a primary affective disorder. And one of our doctoral students, um, about a decade ago, Caroline King, actually did a study where she got people with chronic fatigue syndrome, another group with major depressive disorder, and she was able to make 100% correct classifications of these two categories. But you have to ask the right questions. And these are the questions involving post exertional malaise severity, unrefreshing sleep severity, confusion disorientation severity, shortness of breath, self-approach. If you ask the right questions, you can differentiate the groups. So let me give you an example of what that means. If you go up to a person with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, and say, what would you do tomorrow if you were well? They'll probably give you a list of things they want to get back to their life. They want to get going. They want to you know, do all the things they haven't been able to do. You ask the same question to a person with major depressive disorder, and they're probably not sure, okay? The person with major depressive disorder has self-reproach, has negative statements about himself. The person with ME and CFS does not. So there are ways of differentiating these conditions. If you bring them all together, then you're never going to find biological markers because the category is too heterogeneous. And if you have a very heterogeneous category, and you don't find biological markers, what happens? You end up concluding that this patient really probably has a psychiatric disorder because you can't find anything biological. That's what happened with MS. Multiple sclerosis was thought to be a psychiatric disorder up to the 1960s because there wasn't a biological marker. And that's probably what's also occurred here. So, just something to think about, the importance of basically this diagnostic decision. So, we at DePaul have been working with the computer science department. Um, and the computer science department has something called data mining or machine learning. It's also called artificial intelligence. So we've been working with people over there. Um, and we have been basically trying to take very large data sets 
and try to uncover patterns. So having people who don't have this illness, having people with this illness, and trying to put symptoms into these equations that begin to learn and try to find out what best discriminates these groups. And in our last research, we've been able to get about 95% of participants with disease, illness, versus those with controls. So we can separate these two conditions. So again, this is an interesting example. I'm not a computer scientist, but I can go to places within the university and have them take a look at some of our very large data sets and help us analyze the data. So this is another great example of how we don't have to be specialists in everything. What we have to be able to do is bring colleagues in, people with other expertise and experience, so that we can have a better perspective of how to answer tough questions like this. But if we can get it right, and if we can basically come up with a more of an empirical case definition, rather than a group of people sitting around a table and coming up with what they think is best, we have a better chance of identifying people who really have the illness, and that's important for this field. Our recent research suggests that these are three of the critical areas post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep, and neurocognitive cognitive problems, memory and concentration issues. And that these other things, including pain and autonomic, lightheadedness, neuroendocrine, feeling feverish, immune, like sore throats, those things might be subtypes or might be secondary. They certainly don't occur at the same frequency. So I think if you basically think about that and specify these core cardinal symptoms, you have a better chance of identifying people who really have the illness rather than people who don't have the illness. And that becomes critically important because, I'll give you an example, if you bring people into a trial who basically have major depressive disorder and you basically give them something like a non-pharmacological cognitive behavior therapy intervention, we'll talk about that a little bit later, and it really works for some of the people, it might really best work with those who have an affective disorder, like major depressive disorder. But if it works with a certain group, and then you extrapolate that it really should work with all the people, then the people who have a slightly different disorder might say, wait a second, it's not working with us. And then you basically blame the victim. You blame them because they can't get well, because it's not the thing that's the most appropriate for them. We'll talk a little bit more about interventions, but you can see how the diagnostic decision of case definition has such importance with everything else that you do. So, we've talked about ME and CFS not being a rare disorder, and how you can challenge that by doing epidemiology, by bringing in allies, so that we can deal with these power abuses. Now, it's not intentional, but it's something that we can do to sort of correct it, and it takes time, and it takes allies. We can work with different disciplines. We can also work with patient groups who help make it sensitive ways of looking at patients so that we can get the questions right and we can provide the resources to get them in to our studies by providing transportation. We've also talked about case definitions and how we can work with other professionals like from computer science to basically come up with better ways of coming up with empirical rather than a consensus-based approach. And that's something else that we can work on. And that particular issue, we've worked on for a couple decades. And we've become, at DePaul, some of the leading people that have done research. And we have databases now of over a thousand people that have filled out our questionnaires. And we can now analyze data and take a case definition and quickly look to see kind of what types of characteristics of the people that fit those criteria. So we can do that you kind of wonder, gee, is that something community psychologists do? Yeah, because that diagnostic work has public pol policy implications, okay? Let's go on to the third thing, measurement of symptoms. When I first got involved in doing this research in the early 1990s, um, I noticed that a lot of people were using inappropriate ways to measure symptoms, as well as to assess psychiatric comorbidity. So, let's take a look at some of the biases inherent if you don't do it sensitively and correctly, what are the possible abuses that can occur? Again, getting back to why patients are feeling stigmatized because of the myths that this is a rare disorder, 
case definition is accurate and that we're measuring symptoms appropriately. We're not doing any of those things right, and that's the reason patients are feeling victimized. Okay, let's just take a look at these two instruments. One is called the SCID, one is called the DIS. These are two different measures of assessing psychiatric problems. There's, these are schedules, tests that basically tell you whether you have a psychiatric disorder or not. Now, the DIS, Diagnostic Interview Schedule, is what the field was using to diagnose people. It's very interesting that when we use this particular DIS, 50% of patients had a psychiatric problem. When we took the same patients and we used the SCID, Structured Clinical Interview, a different interview that needed to have a seasoned master's level person give it, it had different ways of asking questions so that if the question came up and it was a somatic problem, it wasn't counted as something that was psychiatric, it was counted as something that was medical. So decision rules were a little bit different. This instrument was developed to be used for people with medical illnesses. This instrument was not developed to do that. But the field was all using the DIS. We did this study and we found that rates doubled if you use the inappropriate instrument. Why is that important? Because if you have a lot of people with a psychiatric comorbidity, and say 50% or higher of people have a psychiatric problem, then you say, well, this is really a psychiatric illness. But if you sort of say only 22% have it, that's getting much closer to the normal population, particularly people with a, with a medical illness. Okay? So that's an important distinction that needs to be made. I remember presenting this study at a convention of researchers who are mostly physicians. And a number of them came up to me eight later and said, well, we're going to continue using this because this is easier to give and this is more difficult. Well, that was an interesting process, right? Sometimes research takes a while. It's really taken almost 10 years after that study before people in the field began switching from this to the appropriate instrument. So sometimes when you come up with your study and you think you're going to change everything, it takes a long time before practice to catch up with it. Because sometimes the bias, the stigma, the structural issues of where a stigma occurs is very hard to change because the status quo is often easy. And to change the status quo sometimes makes it more difficult. And people don't want to change things because it takes more time and energy and resources to do it. That doesn't mean you're not going to get there, but it's going to take time. Let's take another example of kind of how research was looking at symptoms inappropriately, okay? An actigraph is something that kind of allows you to indicate how much movement occurs. It's, some of you probably carry pedometers, you're, kept, you're getting steps, this is just a different way of getting activity. You got your steps there? Okay. So, this is a normal person, okay, who basically has one day of activity and a second day of activity. And you can see this is the activity, the amount, on the horizontal axis. And this is what generally happens. You have spikes of activity, and then very quiet at night when the person's sleeping, and spikes of activity during the day. So when you look at that, you kind of say it's a diurnal pattern, okay? Now let's look at a patient. Very interesting. The pattern's been busted. Now, what happened with the data was that if you count how much data occurs in these two people, you'll find the equivalent amount of data. It's, it's the same amount of activity. So what they concluded was, because the data had the same amount, because this person's busted and, and moving around at night and not moving around as much during the day, but there's not a diurnal pattern, they concluded that because the activity amount is the same and they didn't look at the pattern, they said, well, it must be an illness of perception. People must perceive that they're different when they're really not different. Well, they are different. They have a different total architecture of their behavior. But if you don't look at this type of data sensitively, you end up stigmatizing. And that's the type of research that was coming out in the 1990s and 2000s. Constantly, every research study was missing the boat, was inappropriately interpreting the data, and stigmatizing the patients as basically saying there's nothing wrong with them. 
So we, again, clinical community psychologists, can take that data and show how it could be interpreted differently. So again, that's another way of challenging myths that are inappropriate that end up ultimately victimizing patients. Here's another kind of interesting kind of uh, slide. This is a group of people with ME-CFS. MDD is major depressive disorder. These are controls. And this is percent reporting fatigue for six months or longer. So you kind of look at this and you say, well, gee, the ME-CFS group, almost everyone reports fatigue for six months or longer. But the major depression group does too. So they have a lot of fatigue. The control group has very little on this 100-point scale. So you look at that and you say, well, gee, there really is no difference between the depressed group and the group with MECFS. But let's look at it differently. Rather, if you said occurrence of six months of fatigue, you said the severity of the fatigue. And this is a 100-point scale of a severity. Now that you have severity, you can see that the severity group is about 80 out of 100 for the ME and the CFS group. The major depressant group is less than 50. The control is about 10. So if you, again, ask the question right, not occurrence of fatigue, but how severe is the fatigue, the fatigue in the ME and the CFS group is much more severe. So that's why you have to ask the question right to basically identify those who have the illness. Let's look at another situation. Again, looking at symptoms. If you look at these symptoms, and you basically say, okay, um, here's the basic symptoms that we showed before, those eight symptoms. And this is a 100-point scale of intensity. And this is today in the worst period. If you look at these symptoms, what you basically find is that this is a healthy person. And they have four symptoms. What did we say? Four out of eight, right? So here you have a person who has four of the symptoms. So if you just look at occurrence, you're missing people because these symptoms are very common in the population. A lot of people have these types of symptoms, so you can't just look at occurrence. You have to look at severity. Now if you look at severity, this is a patient. This is a 100-point scale. And this is today in the worst period. So what you look at, when you look at a patient, it's a completely different picture. But if you didn't look at this other picture, you'd say, well, gee, pretty different. But you have to look at severity, not just kind of occurrence of these particular symptoms to really make the differentiation. So that's why we, as clinical community psychologists, can think about these issues, contextualize them, look at the individual, look at what it means to the person, and not just take the behavior and rip it out of that cultural context that basically I think lots of researchers were inappropriately doing. And we, as clinical community psychologists, can help change that. Here's some recent work we're doing with actually a nurse in our nursing department, Matthew Sorensen. And again, ultimately, we want to have self-report data and biological data to help differentiate patients from people who are non-patients. And these are two cytokines. These are the proteins that talk to each other in the body to get an immune system going. And you can see this is a pattern for people who have the illness. This is a pattern for people who don't. You can see that this is a healthy group. It's a completely different structure. We're not going to go through all the patterns, but these dimensions suggest that the immune systems of patients are very different than the immune systems of people who are non-patients. And, and we can make these differentiations, but it really, you've got to look at the data carefully. And sometimes if you just look at one particular cytokine, you're not going to see the difference if you look at patterns. So in a sense, it's very interesting, you know, we are talking about networks. So we often talk about social networks. Here we're talking about networks of proteins in the body. So we can basically help try to help diagnose people appropriately by looking at the interconnections of these proteins rather than them individually. And again, that's what we who have a more systems perspective can bring to even biological data. Okay, so we've talked about a myth of being a rare disorder. And we basically said that that was a myth. And if you basically have yuppie flu characterization, that's going to be a negative characteristic that patients have to experience because of inappropriate research. We've talked about the case definition. 
consensus case definitions that miss the cardinal features of an illness, again, victimize patients, because you sometimes bring the wrong people into your studies. And if you bring the wrong people into the studies, you're never going to get biological markers. We've also talked about symptoms. They've got to be sensitively, ecologically, validly understood. And if you basically just think about that data without under, understanding the context of those symptoms, you can make terrible decisions and basically suggest, as has been done, that there's nothing wrong with these patients. They just have a perception problem. And that's what occurred. But now let's talk about the term, chronic fatigue syndrome. Is chronic fatigue syndrome the very label stigmatizing? And I think it is. In the mid-1950s to the 1980s, patients actually referred to this condition as ME, or myalgic encephalomyelitis. And then, in 1988, the Centers for Disease Control, Atlanta, named the illness chronic fatigue syndrome. Where'd they come up with that? Well, fatigue is a very strong symptom. But fatigue is a very prominent symptom of a lot of things, including everyday life. You know, if I were to ask you folks if you're fatigued, I'd say quite a few of you experience fatigue. If you run a race, you all experience fatigue. So fatigue is something we all experience, particularly under exertion. So if you just focus on chronic fatigue, it trivializes the illness because a lot of people have fatigue, do what they're doing and get on with their life and go to school and go to work. But if you just call it fatigue, think about it this. If you just said you have a chronic cough syndrome, syndrome, chronic cough syndrome. You'd say, well, you know, everyone coughs. What's the big deal? You call it kind of bronchitis or emphysema. You say, well, gee, this is something that's probably more serious. So the name counts. But, you know, we didn't have any information on that. All we had was a name that patients hated. Because patients, they go to their physicians, and the physician would basically tend to minimize their condition and basically say, oh, chronic fatigue syndrome, go see the psychiatrist, go see the psychologist. And they didn't actually treat their symptoms. And they have many symptoms that probably could be treated, but you've got to take them seriously. So, um, it's very interesting that um, I got a phone call one day um, in 1998 because I had been doing this epidemiology research and people started to hear about our work at DePaul and we're publishing some papers. And a social psychologist called me up. A social psychologist who had a PhD and was a researcher. And she had gotten sick with this illness. And she said, you know what you need to do? You need to do a social psychology study. I said, okay, so what, what would that be like? She said, well, look, what you do is you get a prototype, prototype of a patient who has ME or CFS. Just get a case study. And then put different labels on them. To one group of people, say this person has chronic fatigue syndrome. Give the same case study to another group and say they have a more medical sounding term like ME. And then at the end, ask questions about how sick the person is and assess the attributions. Boy, that was really brilliant. So I told her, I said, why don't you do it? She said, I can't. I'm a patient. I'm sick. So I said, okay, we'll take care. We'll do it. So we did it. We did a couple studies. It was actually a third condition, but keep it simple here. We'll just kind of talk about these two. And we had a person with typical <coughs> symptoms of CFS or ME and told them they either had chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalopathy. And then we asked attribution questions. After reading, these were medical trainees, we basically we looked at attributions regarding the cause and nature of the person's illness. So we wanted to see, does that name influence the attributions? So, for example, likelihood of improvement within the next two years. Well, if you have ME, much less likelihood of improvement. And we also replicated this with DePaul undergraduates, where we had, again, a series of attributions. And what we found again and again was that if you had ME rather than CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, which is a more medical-sounding illness, the individuals who rated these things were significantly more likely to get a medical attribution for the illness than the psychiatric. So, so in a sense, it was considered more serious, 
more debilitating, more important, less trivial. So the name does make a difference. Well, because I did this study, basic research, I was appointed to something that was called the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Coordinating Committee in 2000. And I was asked to be on a name change work group. And that Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Coordinating Committee, why is it important from a policy point of view? Again, this is kind of nice when you think about, you know, basic research on epidemiology, basic research on symptoms, basic research on kind of the name, all slowly percolating into the scientific literature. I mean, you kind of say, this sounds like really medical psychology. It sounds like, you know, is this community psychology? It sounds like more like health psychology, right? It is community psychology. Because doing that research, I got put onto a coordinating committee. And you know what that coordinating committee did? Made recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services on policies regarding this illness, ME and CFS. So that's how you can get sometimes into a policy point of view by doing something. Now remember, that was 10 years of work. So sometimes you got to stick with something for years and years and years, get people to know you in your local community, in your city, or your neighborhood, your community, and gradually people will start coming to you and asking for your advice. So if you do basic good work, it doesn't have to just be research, it can be in other areas, people will start coming to you because you get respected. So that's how you get to do sometimes policy work. So I got put onto this coordinating committee, and I thought it was like really cool because we're going to sort of begin thinking about how we can change the name. We had seven or eight people on a name change work group, and because I had done research on this three years we worked on this um, name change work group, and we came up with a lot of different names, um, and neuroendocrine dysfunction syndrome was kind of one of the ones that we kind of polled, we sent stuff out to the public, to researchers, to physicians, and we finally came up with what we thought was a good compromise that would have changed things, and then we brought it back to Washington, which had then took the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Coordinating Committee and changed the name to a Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, and they weren't ready for that change in 2003, um, so they tabled it. That's okay. Sometimes, just by doing that work, it actually had some influence. This is the advisory committee, um, and uh, there I am. That's what it looks like. That's the unit. That's the Humphrey Building in Washington. This is what happens. And these are based on people who are some patient activists, um, advocates, um, some scientists, and government officials, uh, all working together um, to try to make a difference. So. Over a 10 year period, um, even though they voted against it, ultimately this advisory committee changed, voted to change the name from CFS to MECFS. That's interesting, they made that change. Um, the scientific organization, um, the International Association of CFS, voted to change their name to IACFS ME. Interesting, that's the scientists. And an editor of Pro Health distributed to over 100,000 people brought researchers together to endorse MECFS. Now, that MECFS term is still somewhat controversial, and many patients and activists think that we really should call it ME, and MECFS is a transition term. Um, I personally think having CFS and ME, um, that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, and CFS might be a less group of patients who are less affected, ME might be more severely affected. But in any event, the key thing is the dialogue has continued. As a matter of fact, the Institute of Medicine has just come up with a report. They spent a million dollars to come up with a new name that just got released two months ago. And um, the name they came up with was Systemic Exercise Intolerance Disease, SEID. And they said, we want to change the name to this. And you know, um, I wrote several blogs. Um, criticizing this particular name, um, and um, several patients contacted me, and they kind of said, we don't really like this name. You know, certainly there were some people who did like it, but a lot of people didn't like it. And, and one patient, um, Lisa Petrison, I sort of said to her, I said, well, why don't you collect some data? You know, you know, find out how people think about it. 
and she put a poll together, and she sent it to our group here, and we gave her some advice on it. Um, and she collected data of about a thousand people. This just got released a couple weeks ago, and the vast majority dislike this name. That's that's good, you know. That's good because what it does is shows that if a possible mistake occurs by a very influential group, you don't have to just sit there and take it. You can basically mobilize citizens to collect data to basically try to, you know, provide another point of view. Patients basically don't think this particular name. The vast majority of patients are not supportive of changing this. But again, you can kind of see, because I was involved in doing basic research on a name change group, I have some visibility in the community. So I can basically have some credibility when I write a blog and I send something out and I give my opinion to it, it actually gets noticed. So that's how we, even though I might not be a social psychologist that does stigma research, I can use that method to sort of help bring about change as a clinical community psychologist. Okay, so we've certainly talked about um, this illness not being a rare disorder. We've talked about the case definition being problematic. We've talked about symptoms. And now we've also talked about the term. These are all different things that have led to stigma that patients experience on a day-by-day -day basis in this country and around the world. So the question is, what about treatment? What do patients get when they're trying to be treated with this illness? Very interesting. Is, is cognitive behavior therapy effective? So that's a question that we ask um, because that's basically something that a lot of people are talking about um, and a lot of treatments, a lot of psychologists have focused on that particular treatment. So, in 1998, a group in Europe, Rukulin and others, came up with the model, and this is what the model said. Patients with these illnesses, I mean CFS, um, inaccurately attribute their symptoms to physical causes. Overly are preoccupied by physical limitations. Do not maintain regular activity. Maintain a self-defeating preoccupation with symptoms. Now think about that. If you had this illness and you were going to a mental health worker or counselor or physician who had these beliefs about you, how would you feel? So cognitive behavior therapy is supposed to be used to change beliefs. But if those particular cognitive behavior therapy are changing these illness beliefs, you might be invalidating the patient. So what if a person had cancer? The person comes in and basically talks to their clinician, the medical doctor, and basically the clinician and medical doctor says, you know, I know you think you have an illness that's very serious, and you probably got something, but it's probably being maintained by yourself. And let's work together to have you not think about this illness, not think about cancer, but just think about yourself being a healthy person that has some beliefs that there's something wrong with you. How do you think that person with cancer would feel? Pretty upset. That's the way patients feel in this country. Because patients go to clinicians, they go to medical physicians, and basically they're represented with there's something wrong with your belief system, there's nothing wrong with you. That's incredible. But that's what's happening. So, there's a cognitive behavior therapy model, and we actually tested it out. Um, over a decade ago with uh, this student, Sharon Song's dissertation. And what we found was that, yeah, it adequately represents chronic fatigue secondary to psychiatric conditions. So we had a big model that we tested out, but ME and CFS, it wasn't valid with th those patients. So we had data, but again, just because you have data and you're testing some model out, doesn't mean it's gonna affect practice. You can't just sort of say, there's something that's wrong, you've got to actually try to do something. So that's the thing that kind of our next step was trying to sort of, let's look at what patients are saying. And there were surveys being done, thousands of patients, um, and 
again, a very small percentage said that CPT was helpful. Matter of fact, 28% felt their condition was worsened by using CPT. And graded exercise was felt to be the treatment that made more people worse than any other. So graded exercise involves, I mean, this is what they do. They basically say walk a certain amount of time, maybe five minutes, and each day kind of extend that. So graded exercise, you're slowly beginning to walk more each day. So it's an interesting, here you have an illness that basically exertion is one of the primary problems that patients have. And we're basically saying the treatment is to exert yourself even more. Pretty interesting. Well, the patients have been very upset about that particular philosophy of treatment. So, our group at DePaul began thinking, well, what else could we do? Was there an alternative approach? So, again, think about treatment. Here you have patients who are being victimized in some ways by treatment that's not a fit, appropriate for them. So, we said, it was absolutely interesting, a patient, again, isn't this interesting, a patient from Chicago basically contacted us and said, you know, what really patients need is to stay within their energy envelope. It's interesting, energy envelope. They said that's what patients need. They don't need to be pushed further, they're already exhausted. What they need to do is learn how to sort of be able to perceive how much energy they have and not to go over their allotted energy availability. And what she said was, why don't you call this thing the energy envelope, staying within the energy envelope. And we said, that's really kind of cool, because that's what pacing is. So we had a completely different way of thinking about treatment. So we said, okay, um, the objective is to stay within the energy envelope. And over time, patients might restore energy and possibly lessen pain and other symptoms and lessen their illness severity. So our thought was that maybe this was an alternative way of helping patients. And, you know, what often happens with patients, just to give you an idea, is that they're often very, I mean, just think about it, think about your, your battery, like your energy, like 100, where you at? Oh, like zero to 100, you're at 100. That's like a normal battery. Well, patients have a very reduced battery. So think about this. Um, your perceived energy, think about a healthy battery is about like say you have a hundred, you know, you're you know, you're able to go out there and do everything you need to do today. Think to yourself, what if your battery was at twenty or ten? What would you do? If you had one fifth or one tenth the energy you have now, available energy or stamina. You know, some patients, twenty five percent of patients are homebound. Homebound. Okay? So a lot of patients are able to do more, but 25% are actually homebound. We know very little about those patients because they don't often come in for research because they're sick. But just think about, if you had 20% of your energy, this is what happens to patients. They actually, particularly those who maybe are a little bit healthier, maybe not exactly homebound, they store up their energy, they basically do everything they have to do, and then they have an energy collapse. It's kind of what's called the yo-yo. So in a sense, you sort of store, 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 relax, take it easy, and then you've got the house is a mess. You've got a cooking, or you've got to basically do some grocery shopping, or you've got child care responsibilities. Whatever it is, you know, it's too much. So you try to get it done, and then you collapse. And then you have that period of time where you can't do much, and then slowly you start feeling a little better, and then you have all the stuff that has to be done. That's kind of called a yo-yo. So the key thing is, how do you keep people from doing too much and not doing too little? But sort of right where their energy is. And that's what the energy envelope is about. Trying to help people learn to gauge their life within that protective environment where they have enough energy to do stuff, but they're not over-exceeding their energy. Now, if you over-exceed your energy, and you basically go over 100 to like 200, you know, so you have a bad day. You know, but the next day you bounce back. These patients don't have that experience. So, this is the idea. How do we keep perceived energy, how much is available, this is the battery, in expended energy? How much your demands are, how much you're putting out on a particular day? How do we keep this in balance? 
And that's what we're trying to do. How do we help people chart that? How do we keep people yeah, available so that they're beginning to understand that you can't be pushing yourself? Because every time you push yourself and have a collapse, like post-exertional malaise, you're probably doing some damage to the brain. That's my guess. Um, and you don't want that to do. You don't want to do that. So this is an example of someone who's got an energy of 50, which just means they're, they're moderately active and they can do a certain amount of stuff with 50. You know, think about if you had 50% of your energy, you can still do quite a lot, much more than if you're 10 or 20. But the perceived energy, if their perceived energy is 25, that means their battery and their expended is 50. So this is an example of a person who's doing twice as much as what they have their perceived or available energy. So this is overextended. So this is an example of something we don't want this person to be doing twice as much on a consistent basis that's going to lead to not pacing. So the goal is if you have an available energy and you have extended energy at baseline, you want to try in treatment to get it closer. Does that make sense? So, so that's, what, that's what staying within the energy envelope is about. And we don't challenge patients' belief in a medical cause. They believe it's a medical cause. That's fine. Um, and I think right now there's actually more and more evidence that there is a medical cause for this illness. Um, and we recommend that patients pace their activity, um, stay within the energy envelope. And we have had a buddy mentor program going on um, for many years at DePaul. Um, and we've evaluated several of these programs. Um, and some patients received the buddy mentor and some did not, and then when the program was over, we gave the controls to the Buddy Mentor Program, and we've been able to actually document that the fatigue severity um, was significantly reduced when they received the Buddy. So what does a Buddy do? Helps them out on some of the tasks that they're not able to do because they're too tired. So sometimes helping with groceries or sometimes helping with cooking or just being a friend. So by being a Buddy, um, you're really able to reduce the amount of requirements the person has to do. And by having a mentor, you can talk to someone about some of the issues that you're dealing with, maybe a patient who is doing a little better. So, um, what we've gone over um, during this last hour is um, five different areas. So just to summarize, we talked about epidemiology. And we said that the basic epidemiology of this illness was flawed. And because of that flawed epidemiology, patients got characterized as being yuppie flu illness people. And that's very derogatory. That's very stigma-inducing. And to make a difference there, we at DePaul were able to bring a team together to basically fight for better research methodology and to write grants and get funded and to ultimately publish our results, such that after we published our results, the Centers for Disease Control did a similar study in Wichita that we had done in Chicago and found very comparable results. So we were able to have our data and findings replicated so that we had some data suggesting this wasn't a rare disorder. Okay? So that's one thing that we can do. We can try to take myths that are inappropriate and try to fight them with research. And that's what we're trained in psychology, is to basically collect data, analyze it, and try to make a difference. Now just because we made a difference with that particular time doesn't mean that stops. In, in policy arena that we're all working in, things keep changing. Um, and if you can believe, um, a number of years later, the Centers for Disease Control came out with a new case definition themselves um, and um, suggested that there are far more people with this illness um, than they initially suggested. So they went from being about 20,000 people to over 2.5 million with a new case definition. So we then kind of looked at their case definition. That's why case definitions are so important. And we felt that their case definition was very large and brought in people with major depressive disorders. And we actually took their case definition and applied it to patients with the illness and those with major depressive disorders and found 
that 38% of people with major depressive disorder would have been classified with this new case definition. So the case definition counts. And you can do research on the case definition, and you can try to make it more empirical rather than consensus. And that's the recent work that we're doing. And we're doing that work with people from the computer science department so that we can work with different allies to think about how we can understand case definitions so that we can get it right and get the right people in categories and not the wrong people. So we can do this work with epidemiology or we can work with people from different disciplines. We can do this work on case definitions and also with measurement of symptoms. As I mentioned, if you get it right with the symptoms, it doesn't have to be you have to have all the expertise. We're now working with a immunologist, Matthew Sorensen, in a nursing department to try to look at symptoms in creative, imaginative ways, looking at systems of these proteins called cytokines. So it's really cool that we can think as clinical community psychologists and have contact with social psychologists who deal with symptoms and basically names and how we can evaluate names. So we dealt with social psychologists there. We can deal with immunologists who deal with symptoms. We can deal with case definitions with computer science people. We can deal with epidemiologists on prevalence research. So just because we aren't particularly trained in a particular area doesn't mean that we can't do important research in that area. The key thing is we as clinical community psychologists have to have the larger picture of what is needed to basically bring about stigma reduction for these patients. And finally, victims, victimiz victimization of treatments. If patients are being victimized by treatments that are inappropriate to them, why is it not appropriate to them? Because it might be the classification has missed. And if you get the wrong people, the wrong case definition, and you bring people in who have different illnesses, and then those illnesses seem to do well with this particular treatment, that's great but it might not be the right illness. So that's why case definition is so important, and it comes back to how we treat things. So if you have a case definition that brings people in with primarily effective illnesses, and then you have non-pharmacological interventions that help those people with these types of affective disorders, you don't want to then conclude that it helps everyone, because some folks might not have affective disorders that might not be amenable to these cognitive behavior therapy interventions. So you can kind of see all these things come together, and it's really just a fascinating story about how we, as individuals who want to make a difference, can use science, can use research, can use the psychological methods that we know, can use networking to bring in different professionals so that we can have teams of people that think about these types of social problems and diagnostic challenges, and we can ultimately have policy implications. We can take this data and we can get onto commissions like the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Coordinating Committee, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. We can actually work on scientific bodies like the group that's the scientists, International Association of CFSME. Or we can work with patient groups with different national organizations to get funding with them and provide data back to them. So there's all types of opportunities that we as clinical community psychologists can have. So let me just kind of go real quickly over the five principles that I think I've talked about, and this is an ex 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 illustrations of this. From Principles of Social Change, which some of you know, it's a book that I wrote the last couple of years, um, really talked about we can work on ME and CFS. This is one example, but there's actually multiple examples, and any of you can have an area that you're interested in and can use these same principles. The first principle is that we really need to think about second order change, not first order change. First order change is cosmetic. It's like a bandage on putting on somebody. But if there's an infection going on, you've got to get to the infection. So we really want to get to the structural characteristics of problems. And if people are being stigmatized, we can't just think about helping those individuals in ways that contributes to the problem. Um, you know, I went to a lecture yesterday on mentoring, and mentoring is great. I really think that mentoring research is important, and some of you might be involved in mentoring research at DePaul or other places. Um, but I asked an interesting question. I said, you know, they sort of talked about this one person who um, was 
said, you know, the parent of the child that was getting mentored, the parent said, you know, what I really need is money. And they said, oh no, mentoring programs, we can't give you money. We'll give you emotional support. I said, that's cool. Okay, that's the way mentoring programs are set up. But I said, maybe that's first order. What about second order? Maybe these families who are getting the mentoring need resources. Maybe they need opportunities. Maybe our mentoring programs need to be thinking about how we can change individuals to become advocates so that we're thinking about second order. So those kids are not just learning to have a friend that basically allows them to feel good about sort of having an adult mentor, but maybe they need to be charged with thinking about the food deserts. The fact that there's lots of urban areas where you can't get appropriate food, where the streets aren't really well paved, where the schools have inadequate funding, where there's not jobs or availability. Maybe the kids in mentoring need to be working on social activism. That's a very different vision of a second order perspective rather than first order. You see what I'm saying? So we got to think, and in this area, second order meant we got to change the name. We got to change the type of treatments being provided. We got to change the types of characterizations of patients as being yuppie flu. And if you want to do those things, you're working on second order change because you're talking about the individual and the culture. You're talking about the context that these individuals are involved in. And you're changing structural dimensions, not just person centered dimensions. So, second order change should be the goal. But what happens is when we try to do second order change, we run into these very powerful people. Powerful people who basically aren't necessarily evil, they're not bad, but they're used to the status quo. They want to keep things the way they are. So sometimes you've got to be willing to challenge them. You've got to be able to challenge their traditional way of doing things. And in this case, with the ME and CFS arena, we did have to fight. You know, our battles, our battles had to do with individuals who wanted to keep the same name. Wanted to keep a name that was stigmatizing. And sometimes you don't even know who you're fighting. On this name change work group, for example, the chief, the CEO of the largest patient organization, a woman named Kim McCleary, when we were doing this name change work 10 years ago, she was getting millions of dollars from the CDC to brand the term CFS. We didn't even know that, but we knew that she was resistant to bringing about change. Well, when the patient community found out that this large patient organization was basically focused on getting money to brand the name and we're trying to change the name, you know, she didn't get good results from that. And, and after about 20 years, she has left that particular organization. There's new leadership at it. So it's just interesting that there's sometimes powerful people who you're actually surprised are representing positions for different reasons. But you've got to be focusing on second order change and the powerful people that are trying to prevent that change. And that exists for anything that's of any importance. But how do you focus on the power when you're just a lonely clinical community psychologist or social worker or lawyer? How do you do that? The only way you do that is you've got to get people. You've got to get coalitions. You've got to have allies. And the more allies and more coalitions and more people that represent who you are, then you have force. You know, I talked about the Centers for Disease Control. There was a guy named Bill Reeves, and he was a whistleblower, and he had a very illustrious career. But he was said to us that they would never change. He was in charge of more MECFS research than anyone else in the world. He set the agenda for the U.S. And you know what happened? At one point, the patient community, the chronic fatigue syndrome, advisory committee, which I was a member of, a scientific group, they all came together and they basically said after 20 plus years of leadership position, the time had to go. And they actually was able to remove him, even though the government officials said it would never happen. So what I'm saying is that if you want to work on second order change, and if you want to deal with these powerful people, sometimes the influence of individuals and networking and bringing all the different groups together can be a very powerful tool so that you're not doing it yourself. The fourth principle is really long-term commitment. Everything I've talked about here has been five years, ten years, twenty years. Do you have the commitment? 
Why do you stay connected to something long enough to make a difference? Because you have to care about it. That's the key. You've got to find something in your career to work on that's going to motivate you to stick with it. Because if you stick with it long enough, you will basically get to meet all the key people. You'll get to know all the different architectural... You'll get to know different pieces. It's almost kind of like a dig that you're doing. You're going back in time. But you've got to know how everybody is connected from before the beginning. It's kind of like, you know, you are really trying to dig in and understand everything of this social issue. And the more time you spend with it, the more you know who the people are. So you know who is affecting who is affecting who. And then you can figure out who your allies and who aren't your allies. But that's a process. The way you stick with it is you find small wins. And you basically sometimes have to retreat, but you basically stick with it because you care. And the fifth principle is use research. I mean, that's what we know how to do. I think I've given some examples that basically we can use research to make ourselves different from the community activists. The community activists, it's not that they don't are interested in research, they are. But I think we know how to generate research. So we've had people come to us, like the social psychologists, and say, can you do this study? And we know how to do research. We know how to analyze data. We know how to publish it. So those are the type of skills you can learn here. Those basic skills give you power, give you an ability to challenge individuals who are inappropriately using power for second order change, where you can use that data to basically work with coalitions over long periods of time. And those struggles take long periods of time. And ultimately, you can make a difference. Now, we only have a couple minutes left, and I've gone on quite a long time talking. So what I want to do is, um, I think we go to 11, 11, 10. So um, I want to stop here, and I just want to thank you all for, for listening to um, a long kind of range of uh, topics. Um, but I hope that uh, this was helpful. Do we have some time for yes, questions? Yes, yes. We will, uh, any, any questions that you might have, I'm happy to, that. <laughs> to try to uh, um, give you my thoughts. Yeah. You mentioned the CEO of that uh, patient group was receiving money from the CDC to not change the name. So it's, it's a fascinating issue because her name was Kim McCleary, so I can go on record sort of saying <laughs> names. Um, and um, she was the person who gave us money to do the first pilot epidemiology study in 1992-93. So here's a person who's funding us so that we can challenge the CDC and challenge the myth that this is a rare disorder who's an ally of us and then 10 years later, we're on the same committee set up by the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Coordinating Committee to change the name. And then I'm finding that she is like opposing stuff. And it wasn't until later, about a year later, that we found out that she was getting several million dollars a year by the CDC, Bill Reeves, the other guy that I mentioned, to basically brand the term CFS in all types of media markets. So she was going to be the spokesperson for organization called the CFITS Association. So isn't it interesting? An ally on one thing becomes your chief person opposed to it. It gets even more interesting. When I was on the committee, she basically said, would you do a new study for us? I said, and she said, we'll pay you to do the study. So what was the study? It was basically, we were going to change the name to Neural Endocrine Dysfunction Syndrome, NDS. So she said, do a study where you basically get three groups. And one group basically gets um, chronic fatigue syndrome, and that's the patient. The second group gets this new term, NDS, and see what attributions are. And the third group gets, well, this is NDS, which was formerly called chronic fatigue syndrome. Interesting. What did she want us to find? She wanted us to find that if you had a new name associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, it would have the same negative attribution as chronic fatigue syndrome. So that if we change the name, it wouldn't make a difference because everyone would know we're changing it from CFS. So here we had a challenge to do a study 
from a person, and she was hoping us to get, I think, negative effects. We did the study. We took the money, we did the study, because I wanted to find out what it was, and we found out that it didn't matter if it was, if it had that new name, formerly known as CFS, or it had the new name, it was still a better name than chronic fatigue syndrome. So we were able to actually do the research and publish it um, to support our cause. But it's kind of interesting. Sometimes you will be asked to do research, and you got to wonder, do you really want to do that research? But yes, um, I might add that um, three years ago, after being in charge of this organization, they changed from a patient advocacy organization to a research organization. So that's, and now, and now she has left that organization, and someone else is overseeing it. Um, but it's, it's really fascinating. She had very, over time, because of these things, she had very mixed reaction from the patient community. A good person, not a bad person, just had different ideas of what she thought was important. She actually felt that the term CFS at that time was just getting sort of acknowledgement, so we needed, she needed to brand it. But if she's going to do that and head up a patient organization, and over 90% of patients hate the term, not great for public relations. Yeah. Um, you talked about when you did the epidemiological study. Um, at That's a good word, epidemiology. A, a cocktail party, it's just kind of steady. <laughs> well, I know a little bit about epidemiology, you know. <laughs> it's when, good, good to get these words. Yeah. When you did the study um, for the sample population that disproportionately affected Latinos and African Americans, have you done any research, like, with that, on like the social determinants of that, or like how? To well, it's very interesting. Not with the African Americans, but we have done some research with um, Latinos, um, and um, what we we assumed was that um, you know we kind of said, why Latinos? You know, we looked at male versus females, and we found that the males had less fatigue in the general population. The females had much more fatigue. We're trying to figure out what that means, um, and I think. Females in the Latin culture, if I get it right, just have a lot more things placed on them. They've got child rear, child rearing, jobs, and other things, and, and it, it seems like their fatigue levels are the highest of any group we've looked at. And the males, the Latino males, are the lowest fatigue. So that's interesting. And then we looked at kind of people who had come from mostly Mexico to the United States, who had, who were like basically kind of still, um, you know, they hadn't become acculturated to U.S. So they were using Spanish as opposed to English. And we said to ourselves, well, gee, if you basically speak Spanish and you have lower socioeconomic status and you haven't gotten acculturated, you're probably not going to do as well as if a person was, in a sense, kind of acculturated, maybe had more edu education, maybe a better job. And we looked at fatigue levels in those two groups. We were really surprised. We found that the group that was not acculturated, the group that still spoke Spanish, and we're still very connected with their homeland, they had less fatigue levels. So, so we have done some very interesting kind of work to try to help tease apart, um, you know, issues of fatigue in these different samples. Yes? So you mentioned um, second order change, like getting people resources. So I was wondering, like, how you felt the best way to go about doing that was? Like, is that something you would go to, like, like the government about, or is it something that you would be able to kind of take care of on your own? Sure, I'll give you an, like an example. Um, it, it's really a fascinating example. Um, there, there, was, uh, there, there aren't clinics, I mean resources, clinics where people can go to get help. Um, I get phone calls all the time from patients that are stuck. They don't have people that believe them, and they're out of the healthcare delivery system. Um, so we need centers of clinical excellence. Um, and um, we need a network of them. And if you have cancer, if you have MS, if lots of illnesses, you can go someplace and get a workup. But you can't with this illness. So um, the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee um, contacted me, um, a member of it, and asked if um, we would um, work with them to put a poll out. So we put a poll out with Madison Sundquist and some other people in our center recently, and we've collected over a thousand people. And that it's really fascinating the results. First thing, the patients want centers of clinical excellence so that they can get treatment. But what's most interesting, we have where they contacted us. So we have like a map, like a hot zone, so we can kind of see where people are. 
and what we found is there's certain areas of the country where there's no resources. And we also have income levels. So if you have income that's a high level, you get services because you can go to the places where you, you need it. But if you have lower income, you're out of it because you can't afford going to those specialists. And we looked at how sick people are. If people have more resources, they're actually able to get the treatment they need and they're actually able to get better. And the people who have out of the healthcare system, lower resources don't. So we're going to be presenting these data through our person who asked us to collect it in June um, with an effort to try to you know, push the government toward considering what's needed. So again, see an example? Using our creative analytic energies to capture data that can be put into the policy arena to influence resources. That's what second order change is about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that it took time for practice to, to catch up with research. I mean, is there anything that can be done on either side, whether it's community psychologist perspective or from the legislative perspective that can speed up that process? So, um, yeah, I, I think that um, there are things that, that need to occur. If you look at different illness groups, um, there's about 240 different illness groups, um, people with this MECFS get the least funding. Um, for research um, mm -hmm. or for, for the services we talked about, almost at the end of the list. Um, and part of it is that they're exhausted, they're tired, you know, they're, they're homebound. They don't have access to lobbyists or organizations um, that can represent them. So, so the question is, you know, how, you know, the people who get the money, um, who get the resources, get legislators who basically care about what their cause is, and they basically have influence with congressional hearings and other things to get those resources. So the question is, how do you work with thousands of people who are out of that system? How do you work to sort of, in a sense, help them get empowered so that they can influence these systems that haven't been receptive to them? It's a fascinating question. You know, we just talked about another 10-year effort. But that's what's great about this. And there's actually a patient activist now who's putting together a website. Um, and she's putting a film together too. And she's going to be calling for people around the country to provide their ideas for what they think could basically make a difference. So yeah, that stuff is happening. Those activists are out there and they're trying to make a difference. And you know something? They're often coming to us as community psychologists for ideas. And that's ultimately what you want to be. You want to be in a position when different people come to you to seek out your help, to seek out your expertise, to seek out your ideas. And when you become that, you become a valuable player in the social policy process. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're done. So